Ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, reached uh, the last part uh, of uh, this legal session, and now more or less um, the floor is yours. Uh, if you have uh, uh, questions or observations, you are very welcome uh, to make them. Um, Geraldine. Is that on? So my question is for you, Michael. Um, you indicated that the IMO, rather than focusing on new instruments, is, you know, really focusing on, you know, sort of implementing what they have. But I had thought that I heard there was some new thing being developed that was a result of a lot of these um, uh, disasters with cruise ships and ferry ships, where you've had a lot of passenger loss, and I'm just reading about the recent one in China where, you know, a few people get off and it's always the captain and, you know, hundreds of people are killed. So I thought, is there something being done in one of the treaties to address that or a new instrument? Thank you. Yes. It's on? Yes, you can hear me? Uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Well, I think that's right, that there's a lot of work that still needs to be done, and of course, law is an ever-evolving process. Uh, I think the point is that uh, the, the, the legal framework is very much in place, and that's provided by the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea and the, uh, the um, foundational treaties of the IMO. But there's always additional work that's needed in terms of the implementation of those legal frameworks in the form of uh, guidance and procedures and how those instruments are actually implemented on a day-to-day -day basis. One of the real challenges is international law, of course, is and, and this is so clearly demonstrated in the work that's being done in ports, is how these different areas of the law intersect in places like ports. And the work that's been done by these different organizations in the world is, we, we talk about this phenomenon of, um, of stovepiping. You know, we have the, the work that's being done by the FAO and the IMO and the ILO. And we're only beginning to get a sense and, and get better at the way to integrate these different areas of the law. And so these three organizations in particular are working on developing guidance for the practical implementation of some of these instruments on a day-to-day -day basis in the activities of ports, for example. So, I, so the, I very much take your point that there is still very much to be uh, put in place the guidance and the um, uh, the day-to-day -day practical um, uh, instrumentation or the uh, the advice for and training in particular for these instruments to be implemented. But it, it, the, the sense is that in large part the legal framework around that has very much still in place. But is there anything specific like uh, you know even Yes, yes, of course. I mean, this is something that's dealt with on an annual basis by the IMO. It works in different committees. So there's the Maritime Protection Committee, there's the Maritime Safety Committee. Uh, these work, these, and each of those committees have sub-bodies as well, the Facilitation Committee, other, uh, other uh, subcommittees that work on these very specific issues. And so this is very much within the, the stream of the work that's being done by IMO. I mean, uh, with, regard to, uh, with regard to passenger safety, of course, um, the IMO already um, implemented the SOLAS, the uh, Convention of the uh, Safety um, on Sea, um, uh, which uh, contains a lot of stipulations about safety. Um, uh, there's also, with regard to liability and passenger um, casualties, we have the Athens Convention, which is certainly not improving safety, but rather clarifying the results of such a, a tragic uh, disaster which just, just happened in China. Um, and I don't know whether China is a, a signatory state of the Athens Convention, but um, that, that needs to be clarified. And finally, um, uh, I know that the classification societies that they uh, harmonize their standards a lot, and they're working hard on, on improving the um, uh, classification rules to have a minimum uh, standard of security. Thank you. Thank you. I saw another yes, question. Uh, I had a question for uh, Mr. Shuchuk as well. Um, 
And, and by the way, just one comment on, on the last question that uh, uh, Geraldine had was uh, with regards to the Marine Safety Committee and issues like that, very often uh, repeated incidents like this uh, with ferries and so forth and uh, migrants and, and uh, sinkings of uh, vessels with migrants uh, create resolutions in front of the IMO and the Marine Safety Committee, which then eventually may lead to uh, proposed uh, codification, uh, a code that deals with a specific type of craft, passenger craft, high-speed ferries, and so forth to deal with that particular issue uh, above and beyond the safety of life at sea convention and, and so forth. And, and my question had to do with uh, the legal framework of UNCLOS uh, with regards to uh, some of the IMO conventions like the 1958 High Seas Convention, uh, the 1974 Solus Convention that we just referred to, and the 1979 uh, SAR Convention. UNCLOS provides a framework that uh, is an umbrella for those conventions as far as uh, their implementation, I, I believe based on what you were saying earlier. And in particular, I had a follow-up question that was related to, uh, you mentioned that UNCLOS provides a way for, uh, I guess, enforcement of uh, some of these conventions, even for uh, nations or port states that are not signatories. And so I was wondering uh, again about how those conventions fit within UNCLOS and uh, the enforcement, uh, particularly for non-signatory. Uh, states. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, it's, it's a very unique um, exception to the principle in international law that international treaties only apply to the parties that consent to be bound by them. Um, this is a fundamental uh, principle in international law. And UNCLOS, um, and, 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 and this is, uh, you know, there's, there's many different ways of trying to address these problems, but it stems in large part due to the inefficiencies or, or the ineffectiveness of flag states to actually control some of their vessels, is that there needs to be other catch points, there needs to be other ways in which the international community and the states can give some um, uh, effective control over substandard vessels. And so one of the ways that this is achieved in UNCLOS is to allow for coastal states or to require coastal states to be bound by international rules and standards that are developed by other organizations. And in the case of maritime safety and security, those rules and standards are developed by IMO. And so we know the parties that are signatories or that are, are, are consent to be bound to those instruments, but UNCLOS also allows for its own state parties to be bound to a certain degree by those instruments by requiring them to give effect to or to implement those international rules and standards. So it's a very unique exception to the otherwise very clear legal principle that states are only bound by the treaties that they consent to. Bernard. Bernard something uh, part of Hamburg. Uh, I have a question to you, Franz, actually, and to Mr. Husche, or rather, maybe it's even only a remark. Um, I noticed in my former life as, as a lawyer and, and translator for, for um, contracts and that often the problem is um, that if you have um, two parties coming from different countries, you choose the English language because it's universal automatically to, to design and draft the contract. Then you have the problem how to introduce the law instruments um, that you are referring to. So I'm very much a fan of your campaign for using the local law that you're familiar with, but sometimes there is no translation for our law institutes, for our law instruments in the English language. And then you're often tempted into also choosing the jurisdiction because you're already drafting the contract with all the words and institutions that you know from common law. And, uh, that, that there is a real danger lurking in the, I'm sorry for, for the English speaking people here, in the English language. Because you use it because you have international parties, you want a, a, common, a common ground with the language, but then you suddenly slip into the jurisdiction and into the law system of the common law. Because that is what goes without saying, or goes with the English language. And um, yeah, I just wanted to sort of um, give you that, uh, for your campaign, I think that's a very important point to come down to. For maybe it's 
sometimes better to have a bilingual contract um, rather than an English one because then it's easier with the jurisdiction clause. Well, <coughs> thank you uh, for your observation. But uh, on the other hand, if uh, the two contracting parties are not coming from an English-speaking country, the English language is uh, a neutrality-seeking instrument in its way. Um, but you're right. Uh, the language as such is very important. And we are too easy to think if you are coming from a non-English speaking country that you are able to understand it because there are great um, differences between uh, having learned English and, and, and the practice of English in law. Uh, so that's a good observation. On the other hand, if I might add something to the observation, I may give the word to uh, Dr. Christoph Harsje. Uh, we elaborated very technically on the differences between all jurisdictions. But maybe you can add a few words about, uh, maybe Bernard already touched this, language, but uh, culture. Uh. Uh, yes, um, thank you very much. Um, you're totally right that um, uh, cultural differences, and this um, also includes language <coughs> differences, might cause problems. Um, I would be reluctant to recommend or to draft a bilingual contract. Um, it's fine to work with a translation, but you should really know which version is the decisive one. Um, and um, uh, so in case there is a difference in the two versions in two languages, then you really know to, uh, um, have to know which contract is the, the, the one which really is binding. Um, when I draft a contract um, in English uh, language, but um, uh, which is governed, for instance, by German law, then I always put in the, into the contract or into the wording some German phrases to exactly um, explain. There are legal terms which have a very clear definition under German law. And if you just translate them, the, someone <coughs> might not understand that I no, uh, meant exactly this particular term. So that is a way how to kind of circumvene this, this problem or solve this problem. With regard to uh, culture clash, that of course is an issue um, in any international uh, contract or uh, cooperation. Um, uh, due to globalization, we are more and more used to understand the different cultures. Um, and there are hundreds of thousands of good examples where disputes are properly solved between um, uh, parties from different parts of the world. But um, um, I, I also agree to what was said. It's always easier to um, evaluate a legal position if you are familiar with the legal system, not only the procedural issues, but also, or more importantly, the substantial law questions. Um, if, if, on the other hand, you, you said, that um, uh, very often, and you correctly said, that very often if you have um, a contract, let's say, from, uh, between a Chinese company and a German company, both sides do not like to agree on the law of the other side. So then you need sometimes a neutral third country or third uh, jurisdiction. Uh, which implies the necessity to step out of your own home turf and to agree on something which is not that close to yourself as your home jurisdiction, which is normally not a big problem um, uh, because um, uh, in, in these cases you will always find an expert in that country uh, which is then ch chosen which would help to, to uh, link the gap between the two cultures. Is that uh, an answer? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Marcus. Can I just add something? 
France. Yes, of course. Um, oh, yes. Even within our good old uh, adversarial system, there's ad ad uh, advocacy within that. So, if, for example, in Australia, Australia has um, exports 300 million tonnes of coal a year, similar amount of iron ore. That's a lot of ship movements. That's a lot of charter parties. O almost all of those charter parties have got London um, law and arbitration in them. Australian lawyers push hard to get Australian jurisdiction clauses put in there for their own business reasons, if, if nothing else. They've had an uphill battle over the years. I've been involved for 20 years in this, and I've never really seen it take off. And I think that one of the reasoning there is that the uh, independent point of view, in this, where you've got an Australian business and a Greek ship owner, for example, uh, London's, London's independent of those two. Um, but also, I think a factor is that London has the experience and people are reluctant to buy in to the unknown and they know what London's about. They know there are experienced arbitrators in there. It's a bit chicken and egg because until you get a go, you can't get the experience. But for, a m for the moment, it strikes me as status quo, actually, is, 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 is what, what, what's happening there. Well, thank you. But, um, um, well, maybe there is a culture factor, factor in that, too. People are acquainted with London. It's a big shopping town. Like to go there? That's right. So, but, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so um, I can't imagine why in Australia you don't find your uh, common ground to, to, to work on arbitration uh, there. Um, and the same goes for other regions uh, here in Europe. Uh, uh, Dr. Harsha called Hamburg, uh, which is uh, very well equipped, uh, but also other, other regions in, in Europe. Um, if I may make a little bit of promotion for Rotterdam, that uh, we have arbitration uh, possibilities there as well. So I think it is possible to find uh, other, other approaches. Uh, I think we have time to take uh, a last question in. And if, yeah, Mr. Inouye. Uh, I have a question to uh, Mr. Shu the, uh I'm interested to know how the law of the sea react or deal with the uh, climate change issues. The uh, particularly uh, sea level rising uh, will definitely affect the uh, definition of benchmark as you illustrated in your slide. So when it comes to a definition of the territorial sea, the, uh, I suppose each country is responsible for updating or a new definition of their shorelines, right? If that's the case, uh, not every country is um, able to do this in a uniform manner or at the same time just because of the lack of expertise or lack of funds or so many things. I wonder if uh, UN uh, is providing some type of assistance to these countries as a basis for implementation of the law of the sea. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. It's a, it's a very good one and it's, um, <clears throat> something I think we struggle with and, and the international community is struggling with as well is what is the nature of the ongoing obligation on the part of states to deposit their charts and geographic coordinates? Because of course this is something that they do as uh, states parties to the law of the sea is when they establish their territorial sea, their exclusive economic zone, is they deposit their geographic charts. Um, and this establishes the breadth from which these zones are established. Um, so in the case of climate change and the uh, receding sea lines, uh, 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 sea zones, um, maritime zones, there's a real question on what is the nature of the ongoing obligation on the part of states parties to deposit new charts, new geographic coordinates. And you can imagine that there is some reluctance to do so because we're talking about receding maritime zones. Um, so that's one of the issues that, that, that um, uh, the international community is struggling with and exactly what is the ongoing obligation there. The other is in the case of the virtual and or, um, uh, the, the disappearance of, of states. 
uh, due to uh, sea level rise, and that some island states might actually vanish and disappear? And what is the nature of any ongoing entitlement that they might have to the resources in that area? Uh, so it's a very uh, unique and, um, uh, and unfortunately fastly uh, approaching legal question is, is there any ongoing entitlement from of those states to the territorial sea or the economic resources surrounding those those disappearing states. So these are very much very much um, new questions for us, and uh, and uh, and they haven't been resolved yet. Um, they're very much questions of interpretation, and and um, they bring to a head a number of different areas of, of the law. Um, Climate change, of course, is dealt with in, in another completely different form, the UNFCCC, uh, but they very much impact the way that the law of the sea operates and some of the obligations and rights of states' parties in the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. So thank you very much for the question. Yeah. If I may, I have a last question for uh, Marcus John uh, on insurance. Um, do you think there is a, a difference between uh, uh, small ports and medium-sized bigger ports if how they cope with their risk management uh, and their insurance uh, approach uh, because um, the medium sized and bigger ports are able to absorb risks while smaller ports have to insure themselves. Uh, and what I see in my practice is that uh, very often it is incident driven and then they think, oh, I have to think about my insurance strategy. Uh, is that also something you experience in your practice? Yeah, look, I think that's, th thanks, Franz, for that. Um, I, th I think with um, smaller ports, they have less insured assets, so less less value to insure, but the principle remains the same, that they've got an exposure to their balance sheet if there's a, there's, there's a catastrophic incident or you know, a large, large claim that, that comes there. So just because they're small doesn't mean to say that the, the principle's not the same. And then in terms of, of, of smaller ports if, for liability, Sometimes they can generate quite large claims, even though they've got few ship yeah. movements a year. So we, we had one claim in, in, in a small port in South Australia that was basically a grain port, not that one, a different one. Um, and that had 50 ship movements a year. And they'd been taking larger and larger ships, and they were getting Panamax ships into there. And it was right at the edge of it in terms of, of, of depths and um, tug capacity. It was right at the edge of its ability to handle a Panamax ship. And the pilot on board did, 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 did his 50 ship movements a year and, and hadn't really been plugged into the, the, the central head office in terms of its training regime. And, and an incident happened and the ship struck the great, 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 the grain wharf there. And, and that was a situation of a small, a small port that wasn't generating much income, that was sort of a sleepy hollow really, that, the, that sort of the, 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 the main port company hadn't really given much thought to. And that had quite a horrible risk profile, and that really did need its liability insurance. So e even though it's small, it doesn't mean to say it's not going to generate a claim. And in fact, they can be worse risks from an insurance point of view than a large, well-found port. Yeah. And then in terms of dealing with, with claims, I mean, a port like Rotterdam has got a, an excellent legal department, I'm sure, Franz, and, and, and can deal with a lot of this stuff. And, and the introduction to maritime law for port officials. We Correct. Use? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but then the small to, to, to medium-sized ports can, can really benefit from the expertise, I think, of, of, of um, um, specialist insurers that can, can help with that sort of thing that where they don't have the expertise in-house for themselves in terms of claims handling and, so, and contract advice, actually. So your message is very clear. The smaller the port, the more reason for paying attention to your risk profile. Look, I think that is right. That j just because you're small doesn't mean to say you're below the radar. Yeah. Mm. Yep. Thank you. Well, I think we come to an end uh, of this session. And uh, first, I want uh, to thank uh, the speakers for their uh, excellent and informative uh, presentations. Thank you for that. And you, as audience, uh, thank you very much for uh, participating in this session. And I think it is something for um, taking a hold on that this legal session is maybe also something to take in the next program of a conference, uh, for instance, in Bali in 2017. Thank you very much.